All right. At this time, I want to get right into the teaching for time's sake. Not that you have anywhere to go, really. Not that I have anywhere to go. Where are we going to go after this? But uh, <laughs> but we um, but we're going to get into God's word. And I have a special word for you. For some of you, it will come across like hmm, that sounds a little familiar. And there's a reason why it might sound a little familiar what I'm about to share with you. And it's because I believe that God has already prepared us for the times that we're living in. And wherever there is a wherever there is a problem, there's always a promise. There's always a promise from God's word. In fact, there's seven thousand promises in God's word. There's always a promise from God's word to handle whatever problem is in this world. Promise from the word problem in the world. There's a promise from the word. If there's a problem in the world, there's a promise from the word. If there's a problem in your life, there's a promise from the word, the word of God, the Bible, the holy, sacred, all scriptures inspired by God and profitable Bible, all of the scriptures are inspired by God. We're reading the word of God. It's alive. And we're together as the church online, uh, on site, whatever ways we come together, we are one and um, and we're together and we're and we are the gates. We are the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. But I want you to see there's always a promise with every problem. And I want to start by taking you to a scripture in Mark, chapter four. And I want you to see in particularly in verse 26, excuse me, verse 30, verse 35. Let's start there. It says on the same day and I'll get to what day that was in a moment on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over, let us go over to the other side. God, Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. And he says to his disciples, let's go to the other side. We're going to the other side. And I want you to know whatever crisis is happening in this world today, whatever crisis will happen a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to the other side. Amen. I want you to say that right where you're watching. Say, I'm going to the other side. And I love how he said, let us go, let us cross. It's us. So say that. Say, let us go to the other side. Say, we're going to the other side. You see, he includes us because we're not doing this alone. We're doing this together. We're going to the other side. And the Bible says, so they got in the boat as the scripture continues here. And they took Jesus in the boat just as he was and other little boats were with him. Now, that should speak to us something that they took him in the boat just as he was. In other words, God wants you to accept Jesus into your life just as he is, not a different Jesus, not a a, a weak Jesus, not a, a suffering Jesus. He was the suffering Jesus. Now he's the glorious Jesus. And they took Jesus in the boat just as he was. That spoke to me the first time I saw that and made me realize, wow, we get to take Jesus into our lives just as he is. We don't have an inferior Jesus. We don't have a Jesus that's different than the Jesus that walked the earth 2000 years ago. We get to take him just as he is. And now what happened? A great storm of wind began to come and beat against that boat. And the Bible says, that Jesus and it was filling the boat. And but Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Then he arose. You know the story. And he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. But then he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So we're talking about freedom from fear today, faith, not fear. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I want to drill down on this for a moment, but I want you to see Jesus attitude once he gets in the boat. And even in the midst of the storm, what is Jesus doing? He is sleeping. God has called us to rest 
in his promise. He's called us to not get nervous, not get worried, not get anxious. What's going to deliver us from fear and anxiety is the promise that God has made. And God gives promises because of God's love. God loves us and therefore he gives us his promises that love is always God's love is always accompanied with a promise. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, wherever there's God's love, there's also God's promise. So he there's also a gift that he gives. God so loved the world that he gave. God always accompanies his promises with a gift or accompanies his love with a gift. God's love is always accompanied with a gift. And because God loves us, he always gives us a promise for whatever situation we're in. Now, I'm going to dive into Jesus question to them when he said, where is your faith? Why are you so fearful? So if Jesus asks the question, why are you so fearful? Then that implies to us we don't have to be so fearful. If he's saying if he's asking the question, why are you guys so afraid? Where's your faith? Then we there must be a way for us to get to the place where we aren't afraid and there must be a way to get to the place where we're full of faith and there must be a, a, a way that we can get to the place where we have peace and great calm, even when there's a storm raging around us. There must be a way. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, why are you guys so fearful? He said that because they didn't have to be fearful. And I'll tell you why they didn't have to be fearful and what we're supposed to do in times of crisis. And you, some of you are going to say, oh, I knew he was going to say that. Good. That means you've been learning. <laughs> oh, I knew he was going to say that. Good. Then I'm doing my job because we can't learn by hearing something once. We have to hear it over and over and over and over again until it permeates our mindset, permeates our thinking, permeates our way of looking at things, permeates our perspective, you know, because you can't control everything that other people do but you can control your response and your reaction to it. You can control how you handle this crisis. You can't control the laws that the government makes other than voting, but you can't control if the government says you have to stay at home or you can't. You have to only do this or do that or go to the grocery store. Listen, we might not always be able to control what they say, but we can control what we say. We can control what we think. We can control the attitude that we choose. And I want you to see that he said, why are you so fearful? So there there's a way to be free from fear. And that's why Jesus said, why are you so afraid? And I'll get to that. But I want you to see why Jesus was sleeping in the boat for a moment, because in Psalm 127, and I want to look at this in the New American Standard Bible, Psalm 127, verse two. And look at what it says, for he gives it says it is vain to rise early, retire late, eat the bread of painful labors. Now, look at what he says next, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. He gives to his beloved even in his sleep. In other words, God is saying here that even when we sleep, he's always giving to us that his gifts to us are not based on us being awake. His gifts to us are not based on, on us having it all together. His gifts to us are not based on on us even uh, you know, being worried or nervous or anxious. He said he gives to his beloved the ones he loves. He loves you. He gives to his beloved even while we're sleeping. What a great father that he gives to us even while we're sleeping. I want you to rest in this season of time. I want you to know that you can get in the boat in the middle of a storm. You can get in the boat with Jesus in the middle of the storm and you can have peace. You can have peace inside. Now, when Jesus rebuked the, the, the wind and he said, peace, be still. The only reason that he could say that was because he had peace on the inside. The only one who has the power over the storm is the one who's not afraid of the storm. The only one that has the power. Listen, the only one that has the power over the storm, the only one who has the power over this crisis is the one who's not afraid of the crisis. 
Jesus was in the storm, but he wasn't afraid of the storm. Why? Because he had the love of God. He knew that God would give him give to him even while he slept. He knew this verse. He wrote this verse. He was the author of this verse. He was with he was with the father when the father spoke this verse. He gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Jesus was convinced of the father's love for him. So he knew that while he was sleeping, God would protect him. And that's what I want you to know that in this season, God's going to protect you because you're his beloved even in our sleep. So I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I'm so worried. I got to watch the news. I got to watch the news. No, no, no. You got to plant the seed of God's word and then rest and trust in his grace and trust in his goodness and trust in his love. And he said he gives Jesus knew this. So how did Jesus have so much peace? Because Jesus knew what um, what Psalm 127 verse two said. And I'll show you why else Jesus had peace. But I want you to know that when God says, I love you and you're my beloved and I'll give to you in your sleep, that's the father saying, I'll care for you. That's the father saying, I got you. That's the father saying, I'm still on the throne and everything's going to be all right. That's what the father means. I will care for you. I will provide for you. I will protect you and I will keep you. That's what kind of father we have. And we're made in his image and we have that kind of power, too, and that we have that kind of authority and we need to get a hold of this. That's why Jesus asked them, where's your faith? Why are you doubting? Where's your faith? Their faith was in the storm. Jesus faith was in God's love and in God's promises. The disciples faith was in the storm. They had more faith and respect for the storm than they had for God's promises. We have to have more faith in God's promise than we do in the storm. We have to have more. We have to respect God's promise more than we respect the storm. We respect we respect the virus, but we respect God's promise greater than the virus. We respect it. It can hurt and it can kill. But we respect God's promise even more and God's promise can heal and God's promise will deliver. God's promises are how we live. We don't live by the promises we make to God. The Christian life is all about the promises God makes to us. So if we see in the storm, Jesus says, where's your faith? Why is he asking that? Because that is the most important question. Where's your faith? in times of storm. He's not saying, why don't you have any faith? He's saying, where are you putting your faith? He's not saying you don't have any faith. He's saying you're putting your faith in the storm. Where is your faith put? Your faith is in the storm. Put your faith in the in the love of God. Put your faith in the promise of God. We're going to put our faith in something. We're going to respect something. We're going to believe something. Are we going to believe everything the media tells us or are we going to believe what God's word tells us? We're going to put our faith in something. He said, where is your faith? In other words, he's saying your faith exists. But where are you putting it? Where are you putting it? Do You see that Jesus questions them. Where is your faith? How is it that you're not walking by faith? How is it? that you seem to have no faith. They had faith. They just were putting their faith in the storm. And that's why another translation says, where is it? Jesus said, where is it now? This is the most pivotal question in our lives where we are directing our faith in the bad news or in the good news. And you got to get a hold of this, folks, the miracle. That happens here in Mark, Chapter four, The greater miracle is not that Jesus calmed the storm. The greater miracle is that he had peace in the midst of it. It's a miracle that Jesus calmed the storm and we can calm storms in our lives, but we can't calm the storms that we're afraid of. Jesus was only able to calm the storm because he wasn't afraid of the storm. The disciples were afraid of the storm, but Jesus wasn't. 
And I want you to get this and I want you to get a hold of this because the miracle, the greater miracle is not that he stilled the storm. The greater miracle is that he slept through it. The greater miracle is that he had peace in the midst of the storm. That's the greater miracle. You say, but didn't he wake up and calm the storm? He wouldn't have woken up. He would have got to the other side, but the disciples woke him up. Don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? Their faith was in the storm. Jesus faith was in his promise. And what was the promise? So as I'm as you've heard me say before, during any crisis and during any situation, the first thing that each of us need to do is take inventory. We need to take inventory of what we have. We don't need to run out in fear for the last roll of toilet paper. We don't need to run out in fear for the last bottle of hand sanitizer. We don't need to run out in fear and take a test to see if we have the disease because you might have it, but it doesn't have you. Because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. (laughs) There are viruses in this world and they come to our bodies. But greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. So we don't need to worry about this. We need to live by faith and we need to put our faith in the promise of God. Now, watch this. There was a promise that Jesus made to them that they didn't realize they had. When we take inventory, the first thing we need to realize is that we always have a promise. There's always a promise for any crisis. The first thing we need to do is take inventory. So in this illustration or this miracle that happened when Jesus, this experience that they had in the storm. If they would have taken inventory before they woke Jesus up, they would have said, OK, let's take inventory. What's the first thing we have? The first thing you have is a promise. And what's the promise in this passage of scripture? Jesus said in verse thirty five, let us go to the other side. We are going to the other side. There's the promise. The first thing that every one of us has whenever there's a crisis is we do need to take inventory and realize we have a promise. So what is the promise here? We're going to the other side. What is the promise in this crisis? We're going to the other side. What is the promise in your financial situation? We're going to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. You're going to make it to the other side. And when was this promise made? Look at verse thirty five. He says on the same day, Mark, chapter four, verse thirty five on the same day, then evening had come and he promised them we're going to the other side on the same day as what? What what day did he make this promise and what day did they get in the boat and what day did he go to sleep and what day did the storm hit? Go back to verse 26 of map of Mark, chapter four, and we'll see what day it was. And verse 26, it says, and he said to them, the kingdom of God is like a man that scatters seed on the ground. And then he goes to sleep at night and then he rises by day and the seed sprouts up and grows. He himself doesn't know how it grows but the earth yields crops by itself. First, the blade, then the head and then the full the full grain in the head for notice the progression here, like the Christian life, the life of faith is a progressive life. The 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 right things manifesting in your life are progressive. The right things manifesting in your life, it's progressive. First, the blade. It comes as a little blade, then the head, then the mature grain of the head. The manifestation that you need in your life is going to be progressive sometimes. First, the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. And by the way, I believe that this season that we're in with what's happening in the world. We're going to see the greatest revival. We're going to see more souls saved. We're going to see more people open to the gospel. We're going to see more blessing. We're going to see more of God's provision. We're going to see more people come together 
for the glory of God. I think the the all the isolation is giving us an appreciation for the ability to gather together. When that happens again, we're, man, what a what a time we're going to have. We're going to have some church. You understand what I mean? Church. We're going to have some church. That's church without an R church. You got me? <laughs> and um, but I want you to see this is that everything God does in our lives is progressive. So don't be worried that the whole corn didn't show up yet. It starts as a seed. But I want you to see. He says the kingdom of God is like a man plants planting seed. And and he said earlier in this chapter that the seed is the word of God. So it's for our lives. The kingdom of God is we plant the seed of God's promise and then we will have rest. You will have you will be able to sleep and you'll be able to rest when you're relying on the promises of God rather than the problems of the world. When you're when you're thinking about God's promise, we're going to the other side that will carry more weight than the storm that you hit on the way. Everybody's going to hit a storm in life. Everybody's going to get hit by life. Life will hit you and it will hit you harder than anybody can hit you. It will hit you so hard. But you got to be able to to know that it doesn't have control to beat you. You you hit back by planting the seed of God's promise. You can you can rest on God's promises or you can stress over what the media is proclaiming and the world is proclaiming and the bad news and the fear of viruses and the fear. And if it's not a virus, it's cancer. And if it's not cancer, it's heart disease. And if it's not heart disease, it's getting hit by a car. If it's not getting hit by a car, it's it's, uh, it's you know, dying of, uh, of, of old age. I mean, everybody's going to die. But guess what? When you have faith, you're going to live in joy and in peace in the process. And you don't have to be killed by viruses. One day we're going to go home to heaven and we're going to see that we wasted a lot of time worrying, that we wasted a lot of time in fear, that we wasted a lot of time being anxious because we need to control what we can control. And you know what you can control? You can control what goes into your eyes, what goes into your ears, what stays in your heart and what comes out of your mouth. You can control that. So we need to take responsibility for what we can control and not worry about what we can't control, which is what the government does or says we have power and authority that all that we'll ever need. Now, watch this. So Jesus makes a promise to them. We're going to the other side and he had already taught them. So so if you go back to verse thirty five of Mark, it says on the same day when evening had come, He said to them, we're going to the other side. So and then what did he do? He went to sleep in the boat. So he's now illustrating for us exactly what he said. The kingdom of God is like in Mark, chapter four, verse twenty six. The kingdom of God is like a man that plants seed into the ground and then he sleeps. He goes to sleep at night. So what did Jesus do? He said, we're going to the other side. That's Jesus planting the seed of God's word. And then what did Jesus do? He went to sleep. He did exactly what he said the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like a man. Verse 26, that plants his seed in the ground and then he goes to sleep at night and then he does that. He tells them in verse thirty five, we're going to the other side in verse thirty six. What does he do? He goes to sleep. He does exactly what he says, exactly what he taught them. The kingdom of God was he now illustrates how the kingdom of God operates in his own life and in their lives. Why are we losing sleep? Why can't we rest? Why are we so nervous? Why are we stressed? Is because your emotions are designed to respond to whatever information you feed them. So if you feed your emotions, uh, if you feed your emotions bad news and the fear of what could happen, then your emotions are going to respond to that bad news and create stress in your body and create fear in your life and create anxiety and worry. But if you if you feed your emotions 
the good news, information that is good news. God is on my side. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No evil will come near my dwelling place. No play will come near my tent. If you focus on the things that God says and the promises that he makes, then you are going to be feeding your emotions the right information and you're going to have peace and you're going to have calm and you're going to be able to rest and you're going to be able to go to sleep and you're going to be able to experience all that God has for you. Now, listen, stay tuned, say, keep watching because we're going to continue on Wednesday. We're going to continue on next Sunday, but I'm going to continue here for a few more mo- moments before we close, because I really want you to understand about what you have, no matter what crisis is happening right now. Th- what I'm about to tell you, what I have been telling you, it works in any crisis. It works in any storm. It works in any situation. And if we take inventory, what did these disciples have? And what do we have in the midst of the storm? Number one, they had a promise when Jesus said, we're going to the other side. That's their promise. Number two, you know what's next? They had God's presence. Number one, they had a promise. So this is the first message I ever preached in this building where I'm preaching to you now is the first scripture I ever taught was this scripture in Mark chapter four. And I, it's when I, God began to un- unveil this for me and reveal this to me and unfold this for me. And now I just got I'm getting more and more revelation from this passage of scripture. It's so good. You can read the same verse 14 years later, 15 years later, 16 years later, still get some brand new out of it. And re- and be able to chew on the stuff from the past and stuff now. But he says, now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was and they were with him. So now watch this. So number one, they had a promise. We're going to the other side. Number two, they had his presence. Jesus was with them. I got good news for you in the crisis we're facing right now. You have a promise. We're going to the other side. You have his presence. He is with you. The Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. It even says his presence gets his presence is intensified in our lives when we gather together. He said, where three, two or three of you are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. So it's a heightened awareness of God's presence when we come together. That's why coming together every Sunday, every Wednesday for the next several weeks is so important. And we really don't have much more to do. <laughs> so we might as well gather together and, and enjoy the heightened awareness and the intensity of God's presence in our lives. It's going to be so great. We're going to turn. God's going to turn this thing around for good. What the devil sent to defeat us, God bent to complete us. Right. All right. So. So now what do they have? We're doing inventory. When you look in your cupboards before you go to the grocery store, got to see what I have, got to see what I need. Let's see. Take inventory. What do I got? Okay, here's what you got before you worry another second. Take inventory of what you have at this second. You have the promise of God. Number one, we're going to the other side. You have the presence of God. He is with you and he'll never leave you. And then number three. Jesus, they wake Jesus up and he gets up and he speaks. He rebukes the storm and speaks to the wind and he rebukes the wind and then speaks to the sea. Peace be still. I want you to see this. And the wind ceased and there was great, great calm. In other words, his words carried power. And so do your words. Proverbs 18, 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue. So listen to me. The third thing they have when we take inventory, what do we have? Number one, they had the promise of God. We're going to the we're going to the other side. Number two, they had the presence of God. Jesus was with them and he's with you. And number three, they had the power of God and the power is in our words. The power is in our tongue. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Jesus demonstrates the power over situations and over storms. Your words, your words are going to take your body in the direction that your words speak. If you speak, I'm depressed, I'm fearful, I'm afraid, I'm anxious. Your body's going to follow those those words of anxiety because your tongue is the rudder of the ship 
And wherever the rudder of a ship turns, that's where the whole ship turns. And there's the you can have a big boat, but it has a little rudder. And the, the little rudder is what moves the direction of the boat. And what's the rudder of our lives? The Bible says our tongue is the rudder of our ship. Our tongue is the is the steering wheel that directs the rest of our life. Our 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 bodies are going to follow our words. Our our finances are going to follow our words. Our families are going to follow our words. Our emotions are going to follow our words. Our words have power. And you got to know that you have this power as we're taking inventory. You got power. Jesus rose and he rebuked the wind and then spoke to the sea. Peace be still. And then what happened? There was a great calm. So now that's the next thing that we have. Number one, taking inventory here. Number one, we have his promise. We're going to the other side. Number two, we have his presence. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Number three, we have his power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got so much power. I don't even have time today to talk about all the power we have. If we stayed if we stayed talking the whole time during this crisis, I would still not run out of things to tell you about how powerful you are and all the power that you have. God has invested inside of you the power to speak and the power to pray and the power to worship and the power to smile and the power to laugh. And laughter does good like a medicine. And the and media is shoving fear down our throats so fast that nobody's happy, nobody's laughing, nobody's celebrating. But we can we can rejoice in the midst of our tribulation. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And man, we have the power to rejoice. And I'm not afraid or ashamed to be smiling everywhere I go. So you can't smile in times like this. Why not? We need to be smiling and laughing. Not we're not being disrespectful to people that are suffering. We're going to lend a helping hand to those that are suffering. Our food pantries open Our we're going to be passing out communion elements in a couple of weeks. We're going to we have our food pantry that's got people that can come and, and have food if they're hungry and they're hurting. Man, we got we're distributing. We're bringing joy. We're bringing answers. We're bringing solutions. We're praying for the sick. We're praying for people that are hurting. We have this power and we have the ability to praise anyway. That's not part of my inventory here, but you can add that to your inventory list. We have we have his praise. So we just added another one there. We got his we got his promise. We got his presence. We got his power. We have his peace. He said, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. So we have his peace. We have his praise. We can praise him anytime. We should be praising him in times like this. Why? Because because our God is sovereign still. Our God is more powerful than the storm. And so are we because we're made in his image. And I want to just tell you. One more thing. To list this inventory. And then next time I'm going to get into so much more deeper into this that you're not going to want to miss a minute of it. And I know you're not going to miss a minute of it because we're in this together. And I want to ask you to stay with me and for us to gather together online as long as we have to. Amen. As long as it takes. But I want you to take inventory. What do you have? You have a promise. When fear comes, take inventory. When a crisis comes, take inventory. You have a promise. Number two, you have his presence. Number three, you have his power. Number four, you have his peace. Number five, I want to get to and we added praise in there. But my my number five here is found. In chapter five, verse one, and I'll close with this. Then they came to the other side of the sea. So they get to the other side. Guess what? Didn't he say they were going to get to the other side? And guess what happened? They got to the other side. It's going to happen. We're going to get to the other side of this thing. And the first thing we're going to do to get to the other side is take inventory of what we got right now. And he says they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So this demon possessed man with a legion of demons is the first thing that happens on the other side. When they got to the other side. There was a man who was troubled, and I want to encourage you 
we're going to get to the other side of this. And once we get to the other side, there's going to be somebody waiting for you to help them. There's going to be somebody waiting for you to help them. And I want you to see this is another thing on your inventory list. You have a purpose. You have a purpose. He goes to the other side and he comes in contact with this demon possessed man. We don't have time to get into this whole story. I have a whole teaching on this we'll get into, but he casts the demons out of this man. And I want you to jump down to verse 18. And as soon as he cast the demon out of this man, verse 18, he was getting back into the boat. The man who had been demon possessed implored him that he want that he might accompany him. And he did not let him. But he said, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he went away and began to proclaim everything, what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at the end of this thing. When we come out of this crisis, we're going to come carrying our inventory. We're in it with our inventory. We're going to come out of it with our inventory and we're going to face a problem. We're going to face a person with need and we're going to have exactly what they need at that moment because we got to the other side. And then when we get to the other side, guess what? The only reason he went there is he cast the demon out of this man. And then he gets back in the boat and goes back to the other side. In other words, that was his purpose. So no matter what happens in this life, there's always a purpose. And no matter what crisis we're going through, there's always a purpose. And no matter what happens today, tomorrow, last week, this next week, whatever happens, however long this lasts, there's a purpose. And what is the purpose is for you to get to the other side with carrying your inventory, carrying all your blessings, carrying all that God has given you. And then you are going to be able to meet somebody. Somebody's going to come in contact with you. You're going to have exactly what they need. You're going to meet their need. You're going to fulfill your purpose and they're going to start over again and keep doing that because this is how we live. We live with God's promises. We live with God's presence. We live with God's power. We live with God's peace and we live in God's purpose. And when you believe that it will drive every bit of fear out of your life, it'll drive every bit of intimidation out of your life. It'll drive every bit of anxiety and worry out of your life. You have the goods. You have what you need. You don't have to be afraid another day in your life. You have to be worried about coronavirus. You have to be worried about any virus. You are the virus to the virus. We're the virus to the virus. We're the antivirus. We're the healed. We're the loved. We're the beloved. He gives us in their sleep. We got peace. We got promises. We got power. We got purpose. We got praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! I hope you're getting excited as I am out here. I can't hear you, but I'm sure you're making noise wherever you are. <laughs> Woo! Let's pray. Hey, why not? Because we got promises. We got his presence. (laughs) We got his we got his power. We got his peace. We got his purpose. We might as well have his prayer, too. (laughs) First of all, if you're watching today, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord. I'm praying for you first. You're not sure you're saved. You're worried. But if I die, what if something happens? What about the next crisis? What if I die of this or die of that? Death is not nothing to be afraid of if you've met Jesus first. If you've accepted Jesus into your life, death is a promotion. We're not to be afraid of it because he's with us. But you may be watching somebody tuned you turned you on to this broadcast, this church service, this online gathering, this moment in time so that you would have a chance to have Jesus in your boat and accept him into your life. Because the only way to go to heaven is not by being a better person. It's it's always better to be a good person than a bad person. But the only way to get to heaven is through the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. He died for all of our sins. And as many as receive him, that's when you become a son or a daughter of God. I want to pray with you. Just pray out loud with me if you'd like to get saved, if you'd like to be born again, if you'd like to be sure you're going to heaven, pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. Say that from this day forward, I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. The blood of Jesus has washed away all my sins. Amen. Congratulations to those of you that 
prayed that prayer for the first time. And if you wouldn't mind, would you send me your address, your name and address, and I will send you my book as a gift. We'll actually pack it with gloves first so that you don't have to be afraid. Oh, what's going to be on that thing? Nothing's going to be on that thing except love. Nothing's going to be on that book when it arrives except faith. Nothing's going to be on that book except hope. But if you'll let me, I'll send it to you as my gift to you. Now that you've prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's called The Power of a New Life. It's this book I wrote here. It's a question and answer book. Fill in the blanks. It's really a great to lay the foundation of the Christian life. So write me at uh, Gregory Dickow, twenty five hundred Beverly Road, Hoffman Estates, Illinois, six zero one nine two. And we'll send that to you. And uh, I want to say to everybody, I want to pray for you right now that you would have an awareness and an awakening to what's inside of you and to what you have. God, I pray that you would open up every one of our eyes to see the great things that you've done and to see how you prepared us for such a time as this, that we're made for these moments, Father, because we have your promises. We have your presence. We have your power. We have your peace. We have your purpose and we give you praise. Open their eyes, Father, to all that belongs to them. I speak to the sick. Be healed. I speak to the worried. Be at peace. I speak to the depressed and the anxious that God calms you now. God's presence melts the mountains of fear like wax melts in fire. I declare healing. I declare peace. I declare confidence over you. I prophesy joy. I prophesy blessing. I prophesy supernatural increase in your life. You say, what if I lose my job? God will get you a better one. What if something bad happens? Something good will come out of it. Perspective. I love you guys. And I say in Jesus name this day and this week and this month and this crisis, we're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. And when you believe that everything's going to be all right.